person that he's a career, that there isn't enough to go around, which is a, a very fatal idea. And, and you know, the question of whether the 21st century is going to be one of war or peace is a question of whether we look upon other nations as, as contributors to humanity's march of progress, uh, and they look upon us in that light, or whether we all look on, upon each, each other as competitors for scarce resources that are running out. So anyway, this is a, a terrific book, and here's Peter to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Let me just uh, take a moment, because it's appropriate to recognize Dr. Bob Zubrin, who's uh, really an extraordinarily brilliant individual who I respect your work, your thinking. Bob, thank you for your absolute commitment and passion and drive over these last, you know, 20, 30 years. It's been extraordinary. So, Bob. And of course, I cannot uh, help but recognize the fact that Dr. Buzz Aldrin is here, and the, a man gives and gives and gives, and I'm just uh, extraordinarily thankful for, uh, for Buzz's uh, work as well. So, yes. You know, if, uh, if I could, I'm going to ask the lights to be up a little bit, because uh, you can see the slides. This is more of a conversation that I want to have with all of you. Uh, and, and share a number of things. We, I might ask the, the, the lights to come down once or twice, but otherwise, uh, if we have the room lights up, uh, that, would be, that would be great. So I can see you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to start with, this is, a, this is a talk that I give to corporate CEOs a lot. I'm on the road most of the time speaking to CEOs around the world uh, about the way the world is changing in a very fundamental fashion. That, uh, that changes the way I think about the future. Uh, and your mindset about the future is everything. If you think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you're not likely to invest. You're going to be looking to hoard. Uh, if you think that the world is expanding in its abilities and the world is getting, um, you know, things are getting better and easier, then you're going to have that mindset as you move forward. And so my goal ultimately here is to give you that abundance mindset. Uh, I'll start with this slide, which for me is the notion that today we're living in a day and age where small groups of individuals, entrepreneurs, a couple of guys or gals in the garage, can literally build a technology that can touch the lives of a billion people. That's an extraordinary day to be alive in. You know, and when I think about the competition that the largest multinationals have that are based in the US, it's not the competition of a company in China or India. The competition they're worried about and should be worried about is the two guys in the garage. Because that's the competition that can blindside them and reinvent their industry overnight. I'm also a believer in the notion that uh, we're living during a day and age where all of our problems can ultimately be addressed and solved. That it's, it's the commitment of a passionate human mind that is the scarcest resource that we have. Someone who refuses to say, I will not give up. So I had the chance to start a new university up in Silicon Valley called Singularity University. I hope some of you may go there as executives or graduate students. If you look at the institutions on Earth today, the, ma the major institutions, whether it's Caltech or MIT or Supiro in, in, Japan, uh, in, in France or Tokyo University in Japan, all of these universities, uh, which started you know, on the order of 800 years ago in India, uh, have one thing in common. They make you focused on a very narrow niche. So when you come out with your doctoral degree, you're typically an expert in a very narrow niche. You are the expert in an ion channel, in a particular neuron, in a particular insect. Right? And you need, a, you need a doctoral degree to understand someone else's doctoral thesis title, let alone what they're, what they're doing. And that's important because that moves us forward technologically. But there was no place that I could go to really get an understanding of where are all the most powerful technologies and where are they going in the world. And so I partnered with uh, a gentleman, Ray Kurzweil. If you don't know him, I, uh, I commend you to read his work, The Singularity is Near, many other books, uh, considered one of the most brilliant people on the, on the planet. We co-founded 
Singularity University, very much in the, uh, in the wake of, in the, uh, in the uh, born uh, on the back of International Space University, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Michael Simpson and Carol Simpson uh, in the audience as well, who just uh, was the past president uh, for a good decade or so of ISU. And SU is located up in Silicon Valley. We have amazing partners with Google, Cisco, Nokia, NASA, Kauffman Foundation, Genentech. And we focus on exponential technologies. And I'm going to walk you through in about, about 10 minutes what normally is a, either a 10-week program for our graduate students or we do a seven-day program for executives. But I want to give you a feeling for this. So when I talk about the fact that we have the ability to address and solve all of humanity's grand challenges in the next few decades, you know, people look at me sideways. They say, what are you, crazy? There's no possible way we can do that. The difficulty is that people are looking at the problems and their world through a local and linear mind. You see, when our minds evolved on the plains of Africa millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, the environment that shaped the actual neuronal structure, the wetware and hardware and software of our brains, was a local and linear environment. What I mean by that is it was local in that anything that affected you was within a day's walk. That was it. The local environment, if something happened to the other side of the planet, you knew nothing about it. It was linear in that the life of your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, you, your kids, their kids, nothing changed generation to generation. It was pretty much unchanging over centuries and millennia. And that's the conditions under which our brain evolved. So we are really good local and linear thinkers. But the world today is anything but that. The world is exponential and global. Something happens in India, China, South Korea. We know about it literally microseconds later. Right? World changes not century to century, but generation to generation, decade to decade, year to year, at an extraordinary rate. So, you know, at SU, you see these curves all the time. It's a linear curve on the bottom, the red line. A linear curve is a board of directors. It is a management team. It is all of us. It is the way we think. We are linear thinkers. However, the, the yellow line, the exponential, is really all of these technologies, all of these information technologies, computational systems, AI, robotics, nanomaterials, synthetic biology, all of these things are doubling in power year on year. And the difference between the way we think and the way the world is going is causing a disruptive stress. This is why 100-year-old, multi-billion dollar companies are going out of business overnight. This is where someone like Chad Hurley starts YouTube on his credit cards and goes from zero to being sold to Google for $1.4 billion in 18 months. Or Groupon goes from zero to $6 billion valuation in two years. And it's also why large companies are getting scared. So we have Kodak, a Fortune 100 company, if you would, $28 billion market cap, 140,000 employees in 1996. This year, it's bankrupt. And you have to know that Kodak invented the digital camera that put them out of business. But why did, they, why did they ignore it? Because Kodak said, oh my god, we're Kodak. We make beautiful images, high precision, beautiful images. This digital camera is a toy. Discount it, throw it away, who cares? They did not understand exponential growth because that toy doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled until it put them out of business. And then in the same year, we've got Instagram being sold for a billion dollars with 13 employees in the imaging business. Now the juxtapositioning here is what wakes up all the CEOs I speak to all the time. They see a 13 person billion dollar company at the same time that $140,000 billion dollar company is going out of business. With me so far? The power of exponential technologies that a local and linear board of directors and management team doesn't think about and ignores. So what does exponential growth feel like? Well, if I take 30 linear steps, you know, one, two, three, four, five, we're all really great linear thinkers. And I can say, any one of you, come up and, and guesstimate where you're going to be in 10 paces or 30 paces. And you'll all know pretty well within 5 or 10%. I say, take 30 exponential steps, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Where are you going to be in 30 exponential steps? Unless you've got it memorized, very few people are going to say you're going to be a billion meters away. And even then, saying you're 26 times around the planet, 
shocks us. And it's that power of exponential growth that can put a company out of business or allow them to leapfrog. Or, as we care about here, allow a young team of explorers or risk takers to go and do something that only governments previously could do. So this is another part of exponential growth. It's, uh, it's from a talk my friend Eric Schmidt gave uh, in Abu Dhabi a few years ago. He said, an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. It's a billion of those things you stick in the side of your computer, a thumb drive. And from the beginning of time through 2003, the world created about five exabytes of data. That's how much we digitized in that time period. In 2010, we created five exabytes in two days. In 2013, next year, we're creating five exabytes in 10 minutes. So we're living in the middle of a data explosion. Every time you pull out your cell phone and take a happy snap, you're part of that data explosion. You go to the doctor and get a CAT scan or a PET scan, or whatever it might be. All of this is being driven by what's called Moore's Law. Now, you probably all know this or know of it. Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel, discovered in the late 50s that the number of transistors being put on an IC chip was roughly doubling every 18 to 24 months. There are two things I want you to take away from this image, two very important things. Now, by the way, this is plotted on a log curve over here, taking you back to your, your sophomore year in high school. And on a log curve, an exponential growth is a straight line. Okay. This is 100 years on the bottom, and this is computational power that $1,000 could buy. So two things to take away. Number one, over the last 100 years, the rate at which computers has been getting faster has been pretty steady. It's been steady through World War I and II, through peacetime, through recession, depression, and boom time. It's independent of what we are doing as humans. So it's pretty easy to predict that it's going to continue on going at this rate. The second thing, even though this is on a log curve, it's curving upwards, which means the rate at which computers are getting faster is itself getting faster. So looking at uh, a curve from my friend Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, this is the next 100 years of computational speed growth. Again, the amount of mon computational power $1,000 would buy you over the next 100 years. In 2010, 1,000 bucks bought you a CPU that was doing 10 to the 11th cycles per second, 100 billion calculations in a second, like the one powering this, this uh, PowerPoint presentation. 12, you know, 11 years from now, in 2023, the average $1,000 laptop is going to be buying 10 to the 16th cycles per second, which is just a number unless you ask a neurophysiologist, and they'll tell you that that's the rate at which the human brain does its calculations. That's the rate at which our auditory and visual cortex processes data. But it doesn't stop there. You know, 25 odd years later, the average thousand hour laptop is computing at the rate of the entire human race. So besides making your kids' homework really easy, what does that mean for you? <laughs> it's going to be transformational. So, those of you who are interested in you know, the vision that the Mars Society has of going to Mars, let me tell you the tools to allow us to do extraordinary things, they are changing very fast. And the ability for people to do what only governments and large companies could do before is accelerating. So it's becoming easier, not only easier a little bit, easier a lot. These are a few covers from last year. Print me a Stradivarius, the whole notion of 3D printing, hooking up the human brain to the internet with optogenetics, and the whole field of artificial intelligence. I'm walking you through, again, in a few minutes, what we, what we spend a week or 10 weeks doing at, internet, at, uh, at Singularity University. Um, how many of you saw the winning of Watson against Je in the Jeopardy game? Fantastic. So uh, above average but not all of you. And I want to show you a short video of what that was. because This was an epic event last year. Um, and I chose this title out of PC World Magazine because I love the title, Watson Vanquishes Human Opponents. So the game of Jeopardy is a language nuance game where you make a statement, you have to ask the right question, and it's filled with understanding human language, which is not an easy thing. Now, Watson, which was IBM's supercomputer, their latest supercomputer, was actually a stack of servers that had downloaded Wikipedia. It was not hooked up to the internet. It had really read and consumed, and one might say understood what the content of Wikipedia was. 
and it went head to head against the top two Jeopardy champions. Right, the person who had won the most games, the person who had won the most money. And let me show you in a short video. So let's have audio up on this. What uh, I'm going to wait for our AV to. He's doing the 9.600 meter dash. Uh, you should be good to go. All right. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please. Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Watson. Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. Watson. What is Crete? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. <laughs> Ed Mel? I love that. I swear they did that on purpose. Um, so the uh, power that makes that possible, 30 years ago used to be one of the scarcest resources. If I needed 100 computers or 1,000 computers 30 years ago, I would have to be a billionaire, maybe the chairman of MIT's computer science department. Today, I can get it you know, at tenths of a penny per core hour, or I can go onto you know, the net and get Amazon Cloud, or iCloud, or Google Cloud, or Rackspace, and get as much computational speed as I need for a minute, 10 minutes, or a year. And not only can I, someone in the middle of India, Pakistan, anywhere on the planet, has access to this extraordinary resource. And it's changing everything, how we simulate, how we design, how we build, how we code, how we build life. Everything is being driven and changed by this. Another field that's coming online is the whole arena of robotics. This is a robot called the PR2 that a friend of mine, Scott Hassan at Willow Garage, is building. He was an early Googler. He's committed hundreds of millions of dollars to doing uh, this future vision of, of robotics, which is going to change the workforce. We have, in addition to uh, the PR2, uh, you might have seen this video. It's Big Dog from, uh, from Boston Dynamics. Again, extraordinary capabilities that are coming online that are going to change our lives in a dramatic fashion. So, I mean, how many of you, when you look at that, have an emotional reaction? I do. You know, it's cruelty to robots. <laughs> but in all honesty, this is what's coming down the pike. Another field is called 3D printing. Uh, it's democratizing manufacturing worldwide. Something will be designed in Bangladesh and printed in your closet an hour later. It's going to change the dynamics and the cost equation. These are devices that print in three-dimensional layers, layer on top of layer. It's the closest thing to the Star Trek replicator that we have, at least today. Uh, it's printing with plastics, various metals like titanium, glass, even human cells for manufacturing artificial organs. And look at what it can print. Here's a polygon within a polygon, uh, titanium high temperature turbine blades. This is a person who lost their lower right leg, scanned their left leg, and printed a composite prosthetic. This is a full scale motorcycle that's, in, that's 3D printed in components in the lobby of Autodesk. And this is a 3D printing of a wall. Imagine being able to print a 3D house using extruded concrete in any number of an infinite number of patterns in a day for a million bucks. Another technology that's coming online that's changing the world, the whole field of synthetic biology. One of my board members at XPRIZE, a good friend, Craig Venter, who in 2001 raced the US government to sequencing the human genome. Spent $100 million and a year of his time to sequence his genome. 2010, 10, nine years later, shocked the world again by creating the first synthetic biology. He basically created a, a million base pair series of ATCs and Gs in his computer based upon the work they had done, stripped, put together what was a basic life form, sent that file as an email file to a company called Blue Heron that printed out that sequence of DNA that he stuck into a blank cell that booted up to be alive. 
Now, what's significant about this is when you control the life form as a programming sequence, right? It's digital programming in the form of life. You can start to do various things, like create a life form that, pro uh, that produces you know, perfect uh, octane, or better proteins quicker, or allows you to terraform a Martian surface. So it really is a micro factory that you control every aspect of. So these are all technologies that are allowing us to change the world in a significant fashion. And uh, I know that my dream since my childhood has been to go into space, and I've had the chance, as, uh, as Robert Zubrin was mentioning, to start a number of companies. I'm a co-founder of Space Adventures. We've, we've taken eight clients to the space station. Uh, I started a company called Zero G. We took, uh, we've taken 12,000 people into weightlessness. Anybody flown in Zero G here? OK, a few of you, four of you. Dr. Aldrin a number of times um, <laughs> on many different vehicles. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I forget who's in the audience. Um, so um, anyway, my dream has been going to space. And, and one of the things that I realize is that really opening the space frontier requires a, num uh, requires a driver, a persistent driver, because it's hard. It's not easy. A consistent driver that isn't, for me, the ups and downs of Congress or an administration. It requires what I think of as an exothermic economic reaction, something that gives off more money than it consumes and allows us to persistently, yeah, you can quote me on exothermic economic reaction. And uh, you, guys are, you guys are getting it. There's a, there's a, few, a few chemists in the audience. So um, that gives off more money than it consumes and drives us forward. And so as I look back historically, what has always driven us to open up frontiers has been looking for resources. Freedom is another one, which uh, is a lot of the thesis of Dr. Zubrin's work, which I am 100% uh, behind. But another one has been looking for resources, whether it's a silk trail um, out of the East Indies, or it's looking for gold and spices in the Americas, or it's looking for oil and, and timber uh, and land on, um, on uh, the West Coast. And so three and a half years ago, I had a fateful meeting with uh, my partner at Space Adventures, Eric Anderson, we said, you know, it's time. It's time. Let's go out after uh, asteroids. Let's go out after uh, resources. And the notion, I believe, is that the ability to do this cheaply and easily and actually economically now finally exists and has the potential to create an exothermic economic reaction. And so we announced uh, we've been working on this for three and a half years in secret up in Seattle. We have uh, a little over 30 engineers working at the company. It's called Planetary Resources. And um, we announced it three and a half, uh, uh, let's see, in April, whenever that was, uh, three months ago. Uh, and it was very widely reported. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the top new shows on the planet that did an excellent job reporting it, uh, probably one of the hardest hitting news programs around, um, uh, John Stewart. Um, I'll show you a, a short uh, video clip from, uh, from John Stewart. World 212! This may seem like science fiction, but today a group of space pioneers announced plans to mine asteroids for precious minerals. Space pioneers going to mine mother asteroids <laughs> for precious material! Boom, boom! is all in. Do you know how rarely the news in 2012 looks and sounds how you thought news would look and sound in 2012? The best part, there's no government boondoggle. This asteroid retrieval project is being completely handled by eccentric billionaires. They are some of the most influential and wealthiest men on the planet. Google's Larry Page and Eric Schmidt, director James Cameron, XPRIZE founder Peter Diamandis, and billionaire Ross Perot Jr. If you put two Google billionaires with a Microsoft billionaires and some astronauts together, you can't go wrong. So let me be very clear, I am not by any stretch of the imagination a billionaire. But uh, I w Eric and I were very pleased that you know, the first uh, uh, eight people we went to to get backing on this said yes. And it really was extraordinary. 
Uh, we have quite a group of, of folks uh, backing it. And it's, uh, it's a crazy high-risk venture. Um, whether it will work, we'll see. But we're in the middle right now.